Hello, Mark from Enchantment of Eternity here, and I'm here to review uh, the film All Over Me. Um, so I didn't originally plan to make this review, as I'm busy doing a lot of Star Trek reviews, but I did watch this movie the other day, which has always been one of my favorite movies, and I just found that it was a lot that I wanted to say about this film. So, the reason why I titled this video, um, the best LGBTQ movie that you haven't seen, isn't because I think this is objectively the best LGBTQ movie in existence, although it is my personal favorite, but what I mean is focusing more on that you've never seen, because um, a lot of people haven't heard of this film, uh, even those that are familiar with a lot of LGBTQ movies. I found a lot of people never heard of this film, so I just wanted to uh, shine a light on this and sort of highlight this film. Um, so I will get into I won't I won't avoid any like major spoilers I won't give away the ending of the film or anything like that but I am going to get into a lot of specific plot points and stuff that happens in the movie so if you're already convinced and you want to watch it then I would recommend go ahead and watching it before um watching my review however if you're not convinced and you want to hear more then please stick around for my review but I've of course, am going off the assumption that you haven't seen this film, unless, of course, you're one of the few people who love this film, who searched on YouTube for a review of this film, or maybe you just watched this film recently and uh, wanted to see a review and uh, just search for my channel and never seen me before, in which case, welcome, very nice to have you. Uh, but if you're a regular watcher of my channel or just, you know, casual viewer who's never seen this film before, I am going to be taking uh the position of that you haven't seen this film before so all over me is a low budget indie film released in 1997 it follows claude a 15 year old girl in hell's kitchen in new york who uh, is coming of age and discovering her sexuality she falls in love with her best friend ellen who is a uh, pretty self-destructive into drugs and has a boyfriend who is a very shady uh, drug dealer and so it deals with the complications stemming from that. Then the movie stars uh, um, Allison Forland as Claude and uh, Tara Subkoff as Ellen uh, and um, Cole Hauser as Mark. Now, uh, you may not have heard of these actors. i um, be honest, they mostly had supporting roles after they did this film. I never really seen any of the films or shows that they followed up on so i haven't really heard of them much myself uh however if you're a fan of this channel and you follow star trek uh there is a star trek connection as uh one of the co-stars of the film is wilson cruz who is better known to star trek fans as playing dr colbert on star trek discovery of course around this time he was more known for his portrayal of a gay teen in the mtv drama show my so-called life but i personally never really was a huge fan of my so-called life it felt like a show i never really identified with whereas this film is something i really did heavily identify with um also fans of my channel might know um because another show i covered in my channel has a connection uh, with Ann Dowd, who plays Claude's mother. Um, she, of course, was played Patty on The Leftovers, and I had no idea she was in this film until uh, a couple days ago when I rewatched it. And even then, I didn't really recognize her. She looked so different. Um, and there's also Alicia Haley, um, in, who co stars in this film. She is probably best known in her acting career as. Uh, playing Alice in uh, the show The L Word uh, and has been in quite a few other movies uh, as well like The Kids Are All Right, Never Been Kissed and apparently also appeared in the show Supernatural but I've never watched that so I wouldn't know. Uh, she also, what I knew her for was uh, being one of the band members of the band Murmurs uh, the Murmurs, I should say, who uh, I did have their CD uh, when I was younger, and um, they did do a song for the soundtrack. 
Uh, the film was directed by um, Alex Sekel, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, she had her sister, Sylvia Sekel, write the script. Now, Alex Sekel is very interesting because um, she didn't do very many movies, uh, is only credited for directing three films, a short film called Amnesia that came out in 93, this movie, and then a documentary um that came out in 2015 called A Woman Like Me. Now, what's interesting about that film, which I hadn't heard of until, until I did some research, was it is a documentary chronicling her terminal cancer. In fact, she did sadly pass away of cancer in 2014, so a year before this movie was released. It also features a fictional aspect uh, to this film that follows a fictional story of a woman who's based off of her own life who's uh, dying of terminal cancer. Uh, so that's quite sad to learn about that. She also wrote a segment in the HBO film If These Walls Could Talk to that chronicled uh, several stories uh, that involved uh, lesbians uh, in the past dealing with um, discrimination or coming to a coming of age um so yes um it is interesting that uh yeah she did a pretty good job with this film which apparently the original concept for this film was to be a documentary documenting the um riot girl movement in new york that is a lot of female the sub genre i should say a female-led punk bands, um, a genre I wasn't aware of until after I saw this film. Uh, however, the, they didn't really have a direction or a narrative for the documentary, so the, the, the decision was made to turn it into a fictional film instead, which she got her sister to write a script for. Um... But they did, in fact, highlight the music of the Riot Girl movement, which played a major factor of the film. In fact, I would argue that mostly the soundtrack is what the film was known for. So I first heard the movie um, back in 97 when I would rent indie films from Blockbuster and on VHS, and I saw a preview for this film, and I really liked the sound of the music, um, but the movie was was yet to be released on VHS, so I went and bought the soundtrack to it and listened to the soundtrack. Loved the music, so I actually heard the soundtrack before I saw the movie. And then later, as soon as the movie was released on VHS, I went to my local blockbuster and rented it. And did, in fact, love the movie as well. So... The soundtrack, um, I would say it was one of the, it's my second favorite soundtrack of all time behind Lost Highway because I just think Lost Highway is just a narrative or art piece onto itself. And so I think it is more sort of artistically structured than the soundtrack to All Over Me, but all Over Me, I think, has better music or bands that I'm more into. In fact, the soundtrack for this film really influenced or drove the direction of my taste in music like for the rest of my life, like up to this day. So there were two bands on this soundtrack that I had heard of before I got the soundtrack, Babes in Toyland and the murmurs uh however i ended up going out and buying like every album from uh, or at least one album from every band <laughs> on the soundtrack because i love the soundtrack so much in fact it ended up um finding discovering some of my favorite bands whom i bought uh, almost all of their albums and whom i still listen to to this day such as ani defranco helium and sleater kenny um, I also discovered a lot of other bands whom I don't listen to as much in a day, but did like at the time, uh, such as the Geraldine Fibbers, Remy Zero, 12 Rounds, Drugstore, and um, Kim Deal's next band after the Breeders, The Amps. 
So, yeah, needless to say, I did enjoy the soundtrack. And there are some original pieces as well, um, musical pieces, well, and guitar, so I don't know if I'd call it score, but that was written just for the movie, which is also in the soundtrack, which I also appreciate. So, always was a fan of uh, the soundtrack, and as I said, I bought the soundtrack first (laughs) before I bought the movie, so... Uh, or before I watched the movie, I should say, and so I've been uh, very um, more familiar with the soundtrack than the movie itself, but I do, in fact, love the movie. I did have to find, go really hard to find it on DVD, Um, and I, of course, have the soundtrack as well, uh, both of which I got recently um, because I had lost the soundtrack I had had from all those years ago. Um... And it was hard to find the DVD for it, I will say. I had to buy a German copy, and so it's uh, in dubbed in German, but I had to go through, and I can make it in English, but it's not, it automatically comes up in German, so I had to go through and select English when I'm watching it. And, of course, I had to have a multi-zone DVD player, which I needed anyway because I have a lot of DVDs from when I lived in New Zealand. But anywho, um, so it may be difficult to find the movie, but I'm sure um, one can find some place to watch it online. Um, So I remember the trailer was really misleading for the film because it's kind of presented as a wacky, fun teenage film, which isn't really what it is. It's more of a... Um, indie film. It's it's. I wouldn't say it's typical because I do like it better than most indie films, but it has that same sort of style of minimal dialogue, uh, low budget, um, and sort sort of more of a. I would say thoughtful thoughtful tone than what the trailer would suggest, and in fact, that's why. Um, I personally like the film better um, because the most teenage films I tried to be fun and wacky because it felt more realistic, more real life, and more uh, relatable um, to my experiences as a teenager. In fact, I mentioned this before on my channel that I gravitated more towards teenage films that portrayed the roughness and how awkward and uncomfortable and just not good being a teenager is and I think films that try to play it up as fun and party like and having fun I I identify with less and that tends to be what most teenage films are like I'm thinking of films like Can't Hardly Wait <laughs> from the 90s or other such party films Especially not even getting into the the crazy teenage films of the 80s, just leaving that alone. Um, and so I'm thinking of films like um, 1990s Pump Up the Volume, which also portrayed how difficult being a teenager is. Because I look back on my teenage years as definitely not the best years of my life. And I very question anyone who does look back that way maybe they had a different experience as a teenager than i did but i was depressed a lot and it was rough and difficult now i would say i uh, probably the roughest time of my life not the best time of my life so i gravitate towards films like this that portray that sort of roughness and how awkward it is uh to be a teenager and so I personally identified with this film. In fact, I think it's the teenage coming-of-age movie that I identified with the most, which might sound a bit odd coming from a heterosexual cis white male uh, because this film is about uh, two teenage girls who are, you know, or the protagonist is a lesbian, and um, so, yeah, it might sound like something that doesn't, that I'm not the target audience or I couldn't identify with this film. However, the themes of this film are very universal that I think would apply to a lot of people. And the fact the specific plot is something I identified with a lot because Claude um, sometimes is in love with her best friend 
who uh, sometimes makes out with her but sends mixed signals sometimes uh, will make out with her one day and then push her away the next and is dating a uh, someone who is abusive towards her and not a good person and this is something that similar happened to me when I was a teenager as I was best friends with a girl I used to date and I was still in love with her and sometimes she would make out with me and then the next day reject me and then go back to her boyfriend who was an asshole and abusive towards her um and so that is something I can and how crazy that drove me but of course you know my experience was a little different because I was a bit more self-destructive than Claude was and um got more depressed over it and um uh, my ex-girlfriend wasn't as self-destructive uh, as uh, the character in this film was. Um, Ellen, yeah, not as self-destructive as Ellen was. So it's not a, the exact same one-to-one, -one, but it was very similar, and so I could really identify with that. Not just that, just the way that um, being a teenager was portrayed uh, I think it's something, a general theme that a lot of people can identify with. And plus, of course, the music scene also really endeared me to uh, this film. However, um, there are a couple of things that I would say against the film. First of all, um, well, for one thing, I've heard people criticize um, the two main actors, saying that the supporting cast um, really held the film up, and that's something I totally disagree with. I think the performance from the two leads, Allison Foland and uh, Tara uh, Subkoff, were great, were amazing. In fact, all the acting in this film, I would say, is really good. I mean, there are some pieces of dialogue from the supporting cast that I don't that comes off as a tad bit unpolished or not realistic but overall I did enjoy all of the performances uh, in this film however if I was looking at negatives I would point to the cinematography um, but that's not something I blame the film for because it was such a low budget indie film in the late 90s but there are some scenes that aren't shot particularly well especially in terms of lighting some scenes that are shot too dark and uh, don't come out very well but it's not terrible like I've seen worse from say Kevin Smith's movies um, but um, yeah so the other thing that um, I might point out to is um, there's a side plot in the film about a murder where um, this gay man who um, Claude befriends, who's her neighbor, is murdered. And it's implied that it was um, Ellen's boyfriend, Mark, who murdered him. And this seems kind of unnecessary. And it doesn't really... It, it's kind of a side plot and it doesn't take center stage on the film the film focuses more on claude and her conflicting emotions on how her friend is rejecting her and sometimes sending her mixed signals sometimes making out with her sometimes rejecting her and is being with a, a man who is clearly abusive towards her and so i think the film should have focused more on that that the murder side plot kind of detracts just a little bit um from the main character story and it seems that's the only aspect of the scene of the film that seems less realistic than the rest of the film it seems a bit more hollywoodified to have a murder subplot but it's not totally terrible and it does help the main character story along uh and it also deals with hate crimes towards gay men which is uh, an important message to have but I still feel that uh, it is a little bit of a distraction and that the film would have been better off without the subplot. Although I did say I wouldn't spoil the ending, and I won't, but I still wanted to talk about the ending in abstract terms because I thought the ending was brilliant, very emotionally powerful. And the thing about the ending is that it's a little happy and a little sad um, and a little melancholy and um 
a little um, satisfying. It's a lot of things, and it's really su- in really subtle ways. It doesn't really hit you over the head, um, but I think it is really satisfying. And it's not the kind of ending where it's like a typical Hollywood ending where, oh, everything's okay, and this is the end, so you can just assume they lived happily ever after now. Or, like, the tragic ending where, oh, the character dies, or they are miserable, and everything's going to be shitty for her. It's a lot more complex. It's, it feels a lot more realistic in that way, whereas in real life... If you take a chunk out of your someone's life, it typically doesn't end. It's not like, oh, it's going to be happy from here on out. It's going to be sad from here on out. It's just life continues. And you do get that, that feeling that life continues. That it's not, even though it's the end of this story, and it is a satisfying conclusion um, to this story, you do get the sense that... Um, these characters' life will continue and uh, will move on as life does. and But it still manages to be really emotional and, of course, the music does help this a lot. Overall, I would very highly recommend this film, though. I think it really, um, as I said, it's... The teenage coming of age story that I think I identify with the most, that I think is probably the most realistic. And it really, as I mentioned before, it has that minimalist dialogue uh, indie film feel to it. And I think that's why I think the acting was so amazing because the main characters, but especially Claude, portrays a lot of emotions with, without saying that much, just from the way she reacts. And the awkward way she reacts really, I think, gets across what the awkwardness of being a teenager like very well. So I actually think it's an amazing performance. And then, of course, Ellen's portrayal is also really powerful as it portrays the self-destructiveness of um, what some teenagers are going through, such as drug addiction and um being with an abusive partner um so overall yes i think this is one of my favorite movies of all time i would highly recommend it if you can watch it to do so so anyway thank you so much for watching my impromptu video um be sure to check out my channel as i do other reviews mostly covering star trek as i said (laughs) um but uh Yeah, so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.